Paul, thank you so much for coming on to the Brain Health Revolution podcast. Absolutely. Great to be back with my old friends. Absolutely. So we've known each other for a few years, since 2008, I believe, when I first came to Loma Linda. Okay. I think you and uh, Cameron Johnson, who was a psychologist in uh, Loma Linda, psychiatrist. Invite, psychiatrist, sorry, yeah. invited me to a book club, which turned out to be an amazing group of people. And I was humbled. Uh, the first time I actually sat in that group, I was just humbled by the level of conversation, the intellect, um, the, the amazing open conversations. Uh, we had Brian Ball, which passed away, has passed away since Sadly. then, and, and many other people, lovely people. So I've, I've known of Paul for many years, Absolutely. and Aisha knows how highly I regard you and your work and, and the way you approach things, neuroscience and the broader perspective. So I've always wanted to have this conversation and hopefully many more around the concept of neuroscience and how, how you've approached it and what you think of where we are in neuroscience and, and of course the books you've written and the book that just was written right now, Immersion, that's released this week. And I want everybody to go and get this book. Um, it's, it's critical that you get it. It's, uh, we think it's uh, whatever Paul says is w worth its weight in gold. And I really mean that because it's weighed, it's, it's, it's um, uh, appropriately weighed. So with that said, I want to kind of start with uh, a little background. Um, we talked about how we met, but tell me how you got into this whole world of neuroscience. Yeah, so my, my PhD is in economics, my undergraduate's in mathematical biology and, and postgraduate in, in neuroimaging. So um, I'm kind of a weird hybrid person and um, you guys know me well enough. I'm a bit of a Martian. Right? I, I find these humans really interesting, but I don't fully understand them. So I began writing experiments to try to understand why people do what they do. And as you guys know, as clinicians, when you ask people for their motivations, basically they lie. They lie because we don't know. We're not, you know, we're, we're not open to our unconscious processes. So they'll say something, but it's not accurate. Um, so we want to get into the area that I really was interested in, which is in general, why we're so nice to each other when no one's looking, right? What, what does it mean to be a social creature from a neuroscience perspective? And could we uh, develop tools that would allow us to live healthier and happier lives? Yeah, how important? I mean, that's the most important question. I mean, if we, if we consider everything around us from the political, social, economic, and all these aspects are dealing with that aspect of humanity and its ability to interact in the soft language of interaction. We don't have blunt um, uh, algorithms of yes or no, on and off. There are these soft borders that we have to deal with and that's where the chaos arises. And, and that's where you're trying to kind of better delineate. I always tell people, and maybe I'm, uh, it's a misstatement, but it's okay, that you're one of the fathers of neuroeconomics, which uh, is uh, uh, at the interface of not so much financial economics, but how we, Transact the transactions, the human transactions, the, uh, the emotional transactions, as well as the financial that follow from there. Um, uh, and and it's, it's, a, it's the most important aspect of, of humanity to me. So the concept of neuroeconomics, am I misstating that you're one of the uh, founding fathers of neuroeconomics? And what, would that, what is that about? Yeah, good question. So I think if we're interested in the variety of the, of the human experience, one way to address that is to look at, from a neuroscience perspective, why people make different decisions in the same situation, right? So that's, you know, economics is really about decision making. And so by creating experiments with a decision involved and then mapping brain activity into not only that decision, but the variety of that decision, the variation of that decision. So um, we were talking about kind of neuroscience 1.0, I think is looking at a lot of averages. Um, but I think neuroscience 2.0 mm -hmm. is really about variation. Where's this variation come from that Aisha likes chocolate ice cream and you like vanilla, Dean? Or, I mean, that's trivial, but even if you like vanilla, sometimes you order chocolate. Like, what is that about? And so it, it really requires a technology to measure, um, as you said, the unconscious emotional drivers of behavior. So most of what we're doing uh, that we're consciously aware of, as you know, is retrospective. We're telling a story, a rational story about why I bought this nice uh, fitness sensor. 
this really has nothing to do, right? There may be some cognitive process, but most of this is an unconscious feeling state that, oh, this seems like this is the right product for me because I don't really know. Um, and so that seems like is where I think where technology comes in. Um, so as you guys know, uh, one of the first things we looked at is um, why we trust strangers, how we can be around strangers, why we donate to charity, uh, why we're, we're, you know, we engage in all these helping activities. And again, the evolutionary story is clear. It embeds us in, co as, in community as social creatures. We need others to be around us. And so we get kind of um, social benefit from that. Even if no one's looking, we'll still do it because who knows? I can tell people. Um, and we found that this neurochemical oxytocin that prior to the, to the late 90s when we started doing this was only known uh, to facilitate birth, breastfeeding, uh, and sex that this was actually a potent neurochemical and was a key part of the signaling process in the brain that says, Aisha's wonderful, happy to interact with her, and Dean, super sketchy guy, got to stay away, get me in, uh, you know, flight mode, um, right? So yeah. that, that's a good question, right? Which is, you know, the, the fear response is easy to study, but that um, motivation for um, positive behaviors, and then that opens up a lot of questions. What promotes or inhibit oxytocin? Where's that variation come from? What about people who are abused and neglected? What about psychiatric patients? What about people on drugs? And so that was really a, you know, a kind of a two decade research program that led into the development of technologies so that not only have we created knowledge that scholars can read, but create technologies that people can use to really live more fulfilled lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, 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 this, this predetermined state of behavior or, or the subconscious mechanisms that go on um, many layers down is has been known to scientists, sociologists, psychologists, economists, uh, marketing people more than anybody else, and now we're becoming much more aware of it, much more um, cognizant of its uh, workings and how it can be affected. Hopefully, not just as 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 tools of marketing, but also as as tools of uh, better um, uh, human experience, uh, more creativity, more joy. And I think that I'm, I'm more on the optimistic side. So I, I see your work as so valuable because the more it's available to the general population, that it is something that we can uh, uh, not so much manipulate, but affect and influence and, and engineer and change and adapt, then the more people will take control of that and not uh, become subject to it. So uh, it's critical because it's going to become used by others who are hoping to market it and or use us as market agents. But, but it's, if it becomes a more common language vernacular that's used by general public, then it becomes this mass knowledge base that becomes more and more complex. I'm, I'm, Aisha knows that I, I'm, I, I, I say something very controversial. I'm, I think TikTok is the greatest thing that's been invented in a while uh, f f uh, because of this distilling process of truth and, and reason that will always come to the surface. Given all of that, you've written a couple of books, The Moral Molecule, Trust Factor, and now this beautiful new book uh, the, that uh, we've had the, the pleasure of uh, having a, uh, ahead of time is Immersion. So the common theme behind all of this is just what you just described, which is the human behavior and how much we can, we can affect. I'm going to get to this last book, Immersion, fairly soon, but I wanted to kind of get to the moral molecule because the, when I, when we were in that book club, most of our conversations were around that concept and your experiments and the weddings you went to and experimented with oxytocin and all of that stuff. So we'd love to hear about that aspect of it. Yeah. So once we had developed, so a lot of this is tools, right? So, you know, ultimately I'm a tool guy, right? So, you know, we took what was done in the animal literature for oxytocin and found a way to adapt that for humans which involved very rapid blood draws and some, some uh, kind of very careful handling of those samples. And once we had this tool, then we measured the lab and we took it on the road. Everything from um, asking why we spend so much money on weddings by measuring oxytocin release in, in uh, wedding parties to um, field work I've done in uh, the rainforest of Papua New Guinea. So ultimately to understand, is this need for human connection universal? Um, where does it come from? Um, how do we tap into that for greater happiness? And as your listeners know, I'm sure, you know, having a rich set of social connections is more important to extending your lifespan than quitting smoking, right? That is how deep uh, these factors are. So 
part of those findings are that when you have rich social connections, you have uh, um, uh, release of oxytocin uh, many times through the day, that improves the immune system, reduces cardiovascular stress. So, you know, all these factors that we worry about chronic health conditions um, can be modulated, although not cured, uh, by having richer social connections. So I think that's the, the first key takeaway. Um, the, the next takeaway is, well, how do I do this? Where do I get it? So my second book, Trust Factor, was about building high trust organizations. So contra economics 101, um, the neuroscience predicts that when you work in a high trust organization where you rely on your colleagues and they rely on you and you're doing something important for the world, which I think is almost everybody really, um, then not only do you enjoy your job more, greater job satisfaction, less turnover, less chronic stress, but you're actually more satisfied with your lives outside of work. And that's pretty amazing. So the takeaway here is let's create these environments like the eight to 10 hours most of us spend a day at work where we can really uh, lean into our key social nature so that we're more effective, you know, short term, but also we're more effective humans long term. And then lastly, the, the new book, Immersion, uh, I think the surprising thesis or one thesis of that book is that when you have uh, these extraordinary experiences I call immersion, that's a neurologic state we discovered I, I can define later, but this peak experience, the more you have of those, the more you train your brain to be fully present, to be fully emotionally connected to the people around you. And that, again, increases your health span, allows you to live a richer happier, fuller life. Yeah. That's incredible. How do you define specifically the neurological immersion? What does that look like in our day-to-day -day life? Right. So for listeners, um, I'm a very concrete person, if you can't tell that by now. So we always, not always, <laughs> but almost always start when we run experiments looking for uh, factors that will predict what people will do after an experience. So we start with blood draws. Let's look for changes in neurochemicals. Once we find those changes, and if they correlate with a particular behavior we're looking at, then we can optimize high-frequency electrophysiology to capture areas in the brain that have, have high densities of those uh, receptors, those neurochemicals. And so I always want to thank the U.S. taxpayers. We were funded by millions of dollars uh, by uh, Department of Defense and um, U.S. intelligence uh, community and others to identify signals in the brain that in combination would accurately and consistently predict what people would do after a message or an experience. So the goal of this was to reduce conflict by increasing effective communication, right? And particularly across cultures, which is difficult. Um, and so once we did this work, we um, uh, discovered kind of two core uh, neurochemical and neuroelectrical um, factors uh, after measuring about 140 of these very high frequency uh, measures and winning them down over, over many uh, years of experiments. Um, the first is to be immersed, you have to be attentive, right? And so, as you know, attention is kind of a zero one variable. And they're attending at you guys or attending over here, but I can't do both. Um, that's associated with the brain's uh, binding of dopamine in the prefrontal cortex. But the second is that I've got to actually care about what's happening. And for listeners, I think the, the, Perhaps the weirdest thing you'll hear today is that the brain is a super lazy organ, right? It's 3% of body weight, takes about 20% of your calories to run. So it just wants to idle most of the time. So when we see this dopaminergic response and this emotional response, I call this emotional resonance, the, the emotional value I get from the experience, which is associated with the brain's release of oxytocin, there's a very weird neurologic state, right? It's both sympathetic and parasympathetic. It's this rapid switching. And so it really deserved a new name. Uh, and so, so I'll give you an example of this for a second, but we can pick up the signals at the level of the brain, but um, with like high density EEG, but most neurons, most cortical neurons are multipurpose and it failed the consistency test. So what we found was that if I take data from the cranial nerves, which are activated downstream by the dopamine and oxytocin effects, I think of the cranial nerves as the brain's output file. So I get a nice consistent signal from here and these cranial nerves pass through the heart. And so with something like a fitness sensor or a smartwatch, we've written algorithms that let us infer this cranial nerve activity from very subtle changes in the rhythms of the heart. So now we have a scalable ability to measure immersion. So here's the example. What is immersion? So when before I know you, Dean... Before you, 
But I'm going to give one example to make it really clear. Where's yeah, yeah, immersion? Yeah, what's, yeah, what's, yeah, the, what's the subjective experience? Dean, is when you and I go to a movie, at the end of the movie, the boy gets the bur- girl and we start crying and we're like, oh my God. Right? You, you've been so immersed in that story that has had this physiologic effect on you. You didn't want to, right? And for me, I'm a, once I had kids, I became a terrible movie crier. It is embarrassing, right? But it means that you've really transported yourself into that world. And it's sort of beautiful in a way, although also embarrassing. Yeah. That's amazing. I can I, I remember that happening in so many movies, specifically Kung Fu Panda 3, Two. where Poe, he actually finds his inner peace That's about when Kung he's in the Panda. middle of that. Yeah, that, that, I remember <coughs> turning and Dean was just... No, I'm, I'm actually not ashamed of that state. Uh, no, it's, it's beautiful. State, it's, it's beautiful. Groomed. But thank you for describing that, actually. It, it yeah. completely makes sense. Uh, but, but before we go on, uh, so you're pointing to the next. So I'm, I'm assuming the, the, one ba- the one cranial nerve you're talking about is the vagus nerve. Uh, the, actually, a couple of the, uh, nerves, right? So the oxytocin will bind to the vagus. We're also looking... Um, heart rate acceleration associated with that dopamine, which is um, ACTH binding, right? So um, some of the mm-hmm. uh, lower number cranial nerves as well. Um, so the, the yeah. cool thing was okay. it just took Fantastic. us forever to make this tool. And, and why do we make the tool? Full transparency. I am a cheap bastard and neuroscience is expensive. And companies started coming with suitcases of money to my lab and going, gosh, we want to make a better movie, a better ad, a better uh, customer experience. Make education better. We can talk a lot about that. Yeah. And, you know, you guys have this $100,000 machines and 19 PhDs. And I said, sure. And then we go, okay, well, people really need this, but you don't want to talk to a weirdo like me and you don't want to use $100,000 machines. What you want is something that anybody can, can uh, use and get immediate results. And so our, uh, our yeah. company, Immersion Neuroscience, is five years in. And, and it's really gratifying to have a piece of software that anybody can use to make better experiences. And, you know, we live outside L.A., 80% of Hollywood movies have lost money for the last 30 years consistently. Like, how is that even possible in 2022 that you don't know how yeah. to make a good movie? Not a lot of moving parts. I understand that. There's some funky accounting. But most TV shows don't get a second season. Um, the data on Spotify are fascinating. 98% of songs with on Spotify have 10 listens or less. So that's the mom and their bands. I'm wow. sorry, the band and their moms, right? I mean, it's it's crazy. So, I mean, God bless them. Yeah, They're pretty, yeah. producing content, and that's all really nice. But for we as consumers, we have a lot of really mundane or frustrating experiences. I mean, let's think about the DMV. Let's, you know. Yeah. 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 No, no, no. That, that, that's, uh, that's such an important concept. We, we Yes, as human beings, we have succeeded in, in understanding our, 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 the world around us and understanding success, survival success and creative success, but in a very blunt uh, way, it's, uh, the, the, fail, the success fail ratio is still much, almost close to uh, every other organism. Uh, uh, we haven't u- really truly used our frontal lobe and our limbic in- infrastructures very well, but if we can get a, a mechanisms, and that's what we're doing actually in our technology. We're looking at uh, better signal detection systems of human interaction, human um, uh, feedback. Hu- uh, then we'll increase that output of creativity. We'll increase that output of joy. We'll increase that output of survival and, and success and not rely on blunt mechanisms. And I'm not against blunt mechanisms that we've used for thousands of years, but but uh, do better than that. So. I love this this idea to kind of get a feedback as far as that immersion state. You, uh, what, what was interesting to me is uh, how Paul described that immersion state. That, tell me if I'm wrong. It's at the interface of a parasympathetic and sim- sympathetic. You're right. There is a bit of agitation or sense of urgency or angst or anxiety of all those things, whatever the name you might use. But there's also there's this comfort, this zone, this uh, being in the zone where that, and I always tell this to, when we talk to mm-hmm. the kids, Finding that state of agitation that's not sympathetic and uh, overdrive and destructive, but actually raises you to a higher level of consciousness, awareness, and creativity. That's that's amazing. And if that's what you're going for, that's literally the whole objective of human brain is to to achieve that state. Love this. Absolutely love this. Yeah. So I call this relaxed focus. Right? I'm focused, but I'm I'm in in the zone. I'm doing it. It's so comfortable. And the way we found this, I think, is is maybe instructive, which is. We ran experiments where we went backwards. We didn't say, 
could this be this part of the brain or this part of the brain? We just gave people experiments, took blood draws before and after, gave them an experience, um, like showing them a public service announcement about, uh, I don't know, kids with cancer. And then afterwards, because we were torturing them by taking blood twice, we said, okay, we paid you 40 bucks. And then privately, if you want to donate some of your money to St. Jude Children's Hospital, you can, but you don't have to. We did this over and over and over. And we found these signals by seeing uh, what people did, not what they said or intended or liked. So I think, again, that liking question is my least favorite. Uh, it's my second least favorite. My least favorite is should. When you call someone up and they're like, hey, my computer doesn't work. Well, it should. Well, that doesn't help me, right? But same thing with liking. <laughs> you know, how much do I, I don't know, like my, I'm looking for props, my iPhone. I don't know, compared to what? Compared to my kids? Actually, forget my kids. They talk back yeah. to me. Compared to my, my dog? My dog's perfect, right? He's a per But, you know, how can I compare my dog to my phone? It just, it's the wrong question. So I think the right question is, how much does my brain value this experience? And when it's valued, yeah. it's tagged with emotion, it's more easily recalled. And again, it builds that neural plasticity and it lets us be fully present. So if we, you and I, Dean, cry at a movie, it also means I can be fully emotionally present when my kids have a crisis or my wife wants to tell me um, that she loves me or, you know, I don't, I'm not, I'm not uh, lacking that presence and that emotional depth. And so I think by training ourselves to become better human beings, and we certainly live longer and happier. Hmm. Uh, not to belabor this point, um, um, uh, you were saying that relaxed focus. Is there a little bit uh, of agitation there as well? I call a sense of urgency because that, um, uh, is it, is it, I know this is, this might be complete semantics, but, but uh, to me, it's a little bit of importance because there, there, that the higher state of creativity, which the athletes describe, the artists describe, there's a bit of angst or urgency in that. Or are we talking about different things? No, I think that's right, right? So um, that, that prefrontal activity is like, man, I, I am on this, right? It's like when you, you write something or you create something and you go back and look at it and go, wow, who, who did this? Like, where did this come from? It's like it's brand new because you're so absorbed <laughs> in it. So I think there's a, there's a correspondence yeah. between the neurologic state I'm calling immersion in the psychological state that my recently deceased colleague, Mike Csikszentmihalyi, has called flow. So flow is this mm -hmm. self-reported yeah. psychological state where you lose track of time, you enjoy the experience, um, but it's active. Um, you can be immersed in something like a movie and be totally passive. And so the whole point of the technology yeah. we built is to remove the barriers, sorry, to help businesses remove the barriers to give us bad experiences, you know, bad shopping, bad yeah. uh, call centers, um, and then ultimately to to uh, quantify our emotional wellness. So we, I think I sent this to you before we got on the air a couple of weeks ago. We just published a paper showing that with continuous one second frequency measurement for 10 hours a day for weeks and weeks, we can predict people's mood and energy with 98% accuracy, and we can predict troughs and mood two days in advance. So now it means for vulnerable populations, the elderly, psychiatric patients, um, college kids, right? Think of the suicide at college now, it's just scary. There's a piece of technology that allows uh, an intervention prior to a crisis. And so, you know, I've been talking yeah. about the high end. Let's make ourselves happier and happier and have great experiences and grow as humans. But also on the negative end, we've got to really think about, and this is really your work, um, you know, think about the crises we have that when we need medical help, we need real interventions. So we're doing a lot of work with very high stress employees like first responders. Um, so look at the military, uh, police, fire. You see actually a very high rate of depression and suicide in these populations, mm -hmm. um, particularly uh, post-retirement, uh, but not always. And so again, I think that's for lack of tools. So if I'm a cop, am I gonna go to my sergeant? Hey, sergeant, I need a couple of days off because I'm just burnt out assuming I even know I'm burnt out. Or if I had a piece of technology and my phone pings me, says, hey, Officer Smith, um, talk to your sergeant. You're now eligible for a day, paid off day, so you can do some recovery time. And by the way, check in with your counselor online. That'd be awesome. Yeah. So I think this is really part of this yeah. digital health package that is coming uh, to the fore very, very rapidly. I know you guys are on that, uh, on that forefront as well. Yeah. This yeah. is amazing. I'm mean, just to have a a tool or a formula where you can detect the variation or the variability of human emotion 
whether it's in a particular state or before making critical decisions or during during or before a performance, whether it's athletes or someone making a you know uh, a performing in front in front of people, it's 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 very applicable and beautiful to hear that something like this exists in our world. As far as brain health is concerned, um, the the uh, emergence of real time data to look at how people function and whether there is any changes in the way they function that could potentially alert us of any cognitive decline later on in life or you know the 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 trend of their cognition is 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 here and it's wonderful to hear that it's something that we can actually either wear or have or share it with our colleagues and and uh you know our people that are around us and from what i'm hearing it sounds like you're providing this tool for whether it's businesses or or retailers or whoever it is, to have an opportunity to create what you call peak immersion moments, correct? Am I right, Paul? You're, you're exactly going to be able right. to give them that and help them create uh, those kind of moments and and experiences. Yeah, and and then ultimately, you know, we will bring this to consumers. And so my goal, my hope, my wish is that. Just like we have a little ring to complete for our steps, we have a ring to complete for social interactions. And not just the number, but the value of those interactions. Once we have that measurement device, then it's something that we can track. Like, hey, guess what? You know, I'm, I'm uh, 20% down. I got to go check in with my dear friend or my wife or my husband, or right? And, and make sure that's a goal for us and make sure we have that value of connections. And actually, you said something so important that I want to just follow up on, if I may, that the a potent inhibitor of um, the value of a social connection is anxiety. And so we also built in a platform a measure that we call psychological safety. How comfortable am I around these humans? Um, and so we can track that right from sympathetic tone and then just ask, hey, you know what? This is not a good time. And so there's a, a bit of self-learning that goes on, certainly for employees who are using our technology. They get a sense, as you said, Maybe afternoons are the best time for meetings for me, or or maybe Fridays I should work a four day work week because Fridays I'm kind of checked out because I'm stressed out for all the sports or something I take my kids to on the weekend. Right, you could begin to really self manage not only at work but in your entire life if you actually knew the environments in which you're getting a lot of value. You're getting that, um, as Dean said, agitated immersion. Right, I'm really into this thing, yeah. or where I'm just yeah. agitated and I need to get away. Yeah, sure. yeah. I think it's going to be really helpful for people who are introverts or they function very well away from a larger community to also have a better measurement of what is good for them and what is not. Because I think most of the, when we talk about social connections and the importance of being in a community setting, it has been designed around people who are mostly comfortable being an extrovert. But those who actually function very well alone and in, or at least having those moments where they're disconnected. It would be interesting to see what the data shows there. Or in-betweens, like me. I, 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 they, they, <laughs> I'm, I'm the best, most, hour at the most extrovert. Really good extrovert. <laughs> right. In I'm parties, I'm, I'm great in the first hour. Then I disappear. And no matter what happens, I'm, I'm, I'm out of there in the bathroom. We find him in the bathroom. On the yeah. phone, reading or something. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think that the, the longest... Um, and that first hour, I can put all the energy and I can bring it out. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, yeah, so the, to figure all of that out is incredibly important. But at the same time, there's a bit of a, so maybe self-selected or, um, and that concept is also a little murky of how, when do we think we're being self, we're self-selecting or how we're being coerced into something or, or being cajoled or directed or I mean, whatever the terminology is or the level of push or pull, but nonetheless uh, of intrusion as well, because with this, especially with contiguous passive data capture, there's going to have to be some level of intrusion of ca capturing that data, be it through your phones, through some tools in your wrist or some tools around your, you know, some, some arteries or veins or, or, or yeah. nerves. But so that intrusion is going to be something that people are going to have to get used to. Right. So we balance that by having no personally identifiable information on the site. So we don't know who you are, but you know your 
secret code. So you can look at your data anytime. And we always uh, force an opt-in. So your phone will ping you and says, do you really want to do this data collection? You have to want to opt in for it. So as long as you own your own data and if you choose to share it, that's great. Um, so again, for first responders, yeah. um, they will always opt in. There's no requirement. There's no coercion. Um, so the second to last chapter um, of the book is called Persuasion. And so we talk about not only how to persuade people, um, having measured 50,000 brains that nobody, there's no neuroscientist with 50,000 brain observations. Again, my cheat, my special power is I build this platform and hundreds of people a day are being measured. So I have tons of data. Um, so Amazing. number one, if we're going to persuade people, is it ethical? It's ethical if we don't coerce them, if they have time to say no, if they have alternatives, right? If it's somehow beneficial to them, but we have to allow them the opportunity to say, no, I'd rather not do this. That's okay too. And I think from a patient perspective, it's really interesting because uh, particularly with psychiatric patients, if it would help your uh, clinical course, help your clinician to know about your psychological safety, your immersion, should we persuade, induce, uh, cajole patients to use this mm -hmm. technology? And perhaps, we haven't done this yet, but perhaps send the data right to your, for example, your psychiatrist. Um, I think it's a very interesting question. I haven't resolved that question, and we're in talks with a number of digital health companies about yeah. adding this to their platform. So we'll have to cross that bridge when we get to it. But uh, it, it is an ongoing clinical issue, right? That people who need help often don't know they yeah. need help, and we have to be a bit paternalistic sometimes. It, it is. I mean, I, 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 that's a completely different conversation as far as intrusion or or um, how much control we have over our, our, our state or how much knowledge we have, intrinsic and in, internal knowledge we have of our own internal states. Um, but, and and in, a, in a society where, where we are all interconnected and, and the outcomes are affecting all of us, that's, that's a complicated question to address, um, especially post-COVID, where we're seeing children experiencing massive amounts of depression, anxiety, substance abuse, even suicide and things of that nature. Uh, we really have to be a little more proactive. That's a separate conversation, though, but uh, we'll get to that. Amazing. I, I, can, I can imagine uh, this neurologic immersion, the concept um, having a tremendous effect on education and training as well. If we're able to measure real time how people can experience that peak moment, it should be able to change uh, a teacher or a trainer's approach as well, correct? It is. And so if you had children, any listeners who had children in Zoom school during the COVID lockdowns, um, at least in my school district, <laughs> at least half that time was wasted. It was just, um, so you think about, you know, the medieval, literally medieval method of education, which is someone in a forever room talking, as opposed to all the resources we have online and part of that for public schools and, and most private schools is that the schools are paid by hours of butts and chair. They're not paid for competence. They're not pay, paid for, uh, you know, uh, how well they learn. They're just paid for hours. Um, and so I think there's a lot of interesting online uh, schools that even uh, emerged pre-COVID, but certainly accelerated post-COVID, in which instead of teachers, there are coaches. Uh, students do projects either alone or in groups. They meet with their coach once or twice a day. They go over the difficult parts, and then they progress at rates that uh, suit them. So maybe some students finish high school at 15, some finish um, at 20. Who knows? And that's okay. And I think, as you're right, Aisha, measuring immersion, uh, which strongly predicts information recall weeks later, around a 0.6 correlation, which is high. So if you're immersed now, yeah. boom, you got it. You're good to go. And if you're not, that's okay. Feedback. So one of our longest-term and public clients using the immersion platform is with uh, Accenture, big public uh, uh, professional services company, global company, uh, 300,000 employees. They spend $1 billion a year uh, training their employees to future-proof them, uh, give them more mm -hmm. skills. Awesome. What was their mechanism to assess whether that training created value for the individuals and for the company? That post-event survey that we've all done, how'd you like the keynote? Was the lunch good? Wow. Yeah. Is your hotel room okay? I don't care about that. What I want to know is, did this shake up your brain so much that a bunch of that information stuck in there? Yeah. And when you go back to work uh, or take an exam, you can do it well. And so that's what they found. So 
couple takeaways from uh, this, you know, five years now of measuring uh, training education. Um, Accenture has found, again, not us, I'm a software guy. Accenture has found that people cannot stay immersed in an experience uh, for more than 20 minutes without a break, without switching it up, right? Mm -hmm. So they do not allow any trainer to speak for more than 20 minutes now. And then after 20 minutes, reset, and they'll do something else, some say participatory task. Then 20 minutes and then reset, and there may be a debriefing on what each table learned. They've also found that because immersion is metabolically costly, the need for breaks is longer. So again, for listeners, the, the brain neurons are very much like a muscle. They get fatigued, and they need a little refractory period to uh, return to full power. And so longer breaks. So you know, we sort of think, we're adults. I can sit here and take an eight-hour class. No big deal. But really shorter, more intensive uh, sticks more mm -hmm. information in the brain and also turns out makes it more enjoyable. So say so you have an eight hour day, uh, you know, do two, four hour days or even better four two hour days, you know, really break it up into smaller bits. And also for listeners, uh, you guys know this for sure, you know, the brain consolidates information overnight. So if I ever do workshops, I like to do a couple hours one afternoon, give people a homework, let them consolidate and the next morning go back and then follow up and see what people learned overnight, what new thoughts they have, right? So really think of the ways to, to uh, use uh, the information we have in neuroscience to make training and education better. Um, but for kids, yeah, for sure. Better. So I think, I think, you know, if you look at the explosion of educational um, opportunities now, uh, I think this style of that we, you know, uh, learned, uh, went to school in, of a teacher in a classroom with kids in, in wooden chairs, uh, that's going to be gone in 10 years. It's just not going to be here. So it's not efficient. Yeah. It's not wow. where our brain work, and it's not in the you know internet-enabled world. It's not efficient. That's incredible. That's so exciting. And um, I think this is probably going to be very helpful for people who are um, you know, who are experiencing some sort of an attention disorder like ADHD, ADD, the way they assimilate information, the way they recall information, this could be very helpful for them to understand how, you know, what the flow of information should be for them, how much time do they need to, uh, you know, organize those thoughts and those memories in their brains, and how often should they be exposed to that kind of information. Yeah. Because now, right now we have beautiful. very blunt tools. Yeah. So now we're talking about neural diversity, which is a big a focus in my lab now. Where does that diversity come from? And again, how do we begin to optimize experiences so that everyone has a great experience? And you're right, the tools right now, right now are very blunt. And they're also, I think, too public. But if I had a piece of mm -hmm. software on my phone that just said, um, hey, Paul, you know, um, you know, do that module again. Again, I could do that with a test, but I don't really know why I'm not getting the information the right way. So it could be, would you like to see it as a video? Would you like to read it? Uh, would you like to hear an audio? I mean, we can think of all kinds of different ways. Um, so Accenture, again, long-term client, has made a huge investment in training in the metaverse. And so I think these XR kind of activities are really going to expand the way that not only do we train people, but the way we communicate. And so we're happy to be on this journey with Accenture to understand how to create great uh, metaverse experiences. Yeah. Um, Say. The 20 minute period that you were talking about is uh, in medical school, we called it the, the butt brain barrier. <clears throat> you know, anything longer than 20 minutes or half an hour, you're, 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 nothing is getting through. Or if mm. it is getting through, it's not connecting properly. And, and, yeah. and it, this, this, method of sitting in a cubicle for eight hours in a row. It, yeah, it worked. People got through. We, right. we sometimes make the mistake of um, uh, sub, uh, sustainability and su sustenance as opposed to vi uh, vitality and growth. And, and that's the direction we're going to towards in, in humanity. We got lucky. Uh, our kids uh, started with a um, uh, school system, uh, specifically Montessori, but then most of their life they did online and we found this one of these tools called Khan Academy, which was these little short bursts of education. Yeah, it was and absolutely amazing. And they gave them rewards and then they could stop whenever they wanted to, but it usually was no longer than five to 10 minutes. And it just accelerated and it helped during the COVID era as well, that they were, they were in school in, in Cal State. And, but then that during the COVID era, it wasn't as much of a, a, a change for them, but, but this optimization according to different characteristics is the key. Whether you're visual, whether you're auditor, it's none, none of us are one or the other. It's a, 
it's a it's a it's a mixture thereof. The level of anxiety to, the, uh, that that actually builds up, whether it's written, spoken, mathematical, and so on and so forth, all of this can actually even be captured passively. Uh, as they're having the experience, you can actually collect the data that gives you feedback on the experience they're having, and that could be actually then through AI and machine learning and others create a platform in front of you. These these might sound scary to people, but this is incredibly freeing. Myself, I'll give you my experience. Um, um, I'm, I've grown and uh, I'm old enough now to be comfortable with my flaws, and I have many, many, and many. But one of the things that happened, uh, I'm a child of immigrants. We came here uh, around age nine. But prior to that, I was a very good student. I mean, they would take me to schools to do memory games and, and like in front of the whole school and all of that. But that transition where I came to Pittsburgh and that, that in itself was traumatic Pittsburgh, but I'm just kidding. I love Pittsburgh. But then the, tra the transition in language at a very pivotal age, I didn't realize that there has to be a millisecond of translation in my head, no matter how much I work. I mean, I started the vocabulary books by age 11. I was like going through vocabulary books like crazy. I forced myself to read these huge, thick books, uh, history books, but with such difficulty. But I got through it, and I, uh, but there was always a dissonance. I didn't know that. And then audiobooks came. And, and I started that actually way earlier than everybody else because they were in these CDs that you would download. And then so it was like in 2000, early 2000. My life changed. It, it, it actually freed me from that interface disconnect. That interface disconnect that I had developed in my life at age nine was freed. And I was reading or listening to, a, I mean, three books a week. And it was just, Creativity, creativity, and Aisha knows that, that I, I mean, even when we met in Afghanistan, when I was doing this, it's like constant thinking. That in my life, that little barrier took a person that was very high achiever very early, and then there was a door placed in front of him, and then I found an opening. And that's true in everybody. I know some friends of ours, which are absolutely amazing, and, uh, and they're not shy about this. They have this, this little disconnect as far as visual information particular type of, and they found out very late in life that that was the little impediment. Finding these little glitches or um, nuances or, or idiosyncrasies, whatever you want to call those on the positive or negative side, is going to be incredibly, incredibly freeing. You brought a term earlier, what did you call it? Uh, neurodiversity, mm -hmm. right? We are a spectrum of neurodiversity. No matter how good we are at one element, there's another hundred elements that we are at different levels. And if we can optimize that, imagine the creativity of 87 billion neurons, one quadrillion connections, and the creative capacity that doesn't come out to the surface. Paul, you know this better than I do. Um, uh, the, the frontotemporal lobe patients that all of a sudden develop this creativity that they never manifested before. It's not that they didn't have it. We have subdued it through socialization, through... Um, fear or lack through, thereof, lack thereof, yeah, or 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 yeah, all of those things, and every human being has that creativity that never manifests. I love the work you're doing, and hopefully that's what we're doing as well in a different way. And I'm so excited for the for the for the next five, ten, twenty years. Yeah, me too. And I think we, you know, there's an extra layer of weirdness in humans besides our own neural diversity which is, you know, our brain lives in this soup of around 200 neurochemicals. They're changing at millisecond frequency. So what worked for you two weeks ago may not work for you right now because your own physiologic state is different. So I think that's where measurement comes in and just kind of optimize the experience and breaks and sleep. Sleep's super important. Breaks are important. Yeah. Uh, and if you can self-pace and figure out how to do this, I think all learning is self-learning, right? I mean, we just have guides. We call them teachers or professors, but they're just guides and they're not always <laughs> yes. as effective as they might be. <laughs> I can say yeah. that since yeah. I still teach. Yes. Amazing. Yes. Amazing. I, I love uh, the way you <clears throat> described this, this uh, phenomenon as an additional ring. We always talk about food. We talk about exercise. We talk about sleep. We're able to measure those things to a certain extent and apply it and personalize it and and dissect it the way it works best for us. But this has never been a ring. And it's so exciting that we can now potentially have that 
um, as, as a tool. What is the future of your work? What does it entail? What are the next steps? I think it's really um, putting my effort into these two areas, emotional wellness, can you develop tools that anybody can use and make them available? And the second is really getting a handle on neurodiversity. Um, so we're running experiments in my lab now where we measure neurologic activity 15, 16, 17, 17 different ways simultaneously and then use some t- t- statistical models to um, winnow down and see for this type of experience, these are the factors that vary across humans that affect the way we experience them. And for this kind of a situation, here's the set. So really getting a handle on what matters and what doesn't matter because, you know, we have this almost uh, overabundance, ex- uh, what, what's the expression? Uh, an embarrassment of riches in the neuroscience world um, without, yes. I think, without clear guidance, right? So um, I think that's where we're coming yeah. in is to kind of make that guidance really clear. So yeah, what a pleasure uh, to, to talk about this with you guys. Thank you for all the questions. Oh, thank you for doing all the wonderful work that you're doing and for making it available. A lot of times, you know, you know, some some brilliant professors doing this in the lab, but people never find out about it. But, you know, you're uh, you're actually writing about it in your beautiful book called Immersion, the Science of the Extraordinary and the Source of Happiness is available now. And we'll put the links in our show notes for everyone to get it and to understand it and to know of your work and your previous books. And we're so grateful to to have you on our podcast, Paul. And hopefully this is going to be the first of many conversations later on. My pleasure. Thank you so much for the honor of spending uh, this time with you. Send you guys big love. See you soon. <laughs>